Hey, good day and good evening, everyone. Here we are again, it's Tuesday, and it's so great to see you all again. Please let me know if you can hear me, and if everything is okay, then we will start. I'm Sophie, and I'm your host. Welcome to IVF webinars by Egg Donation Friends. We do IVF webinars weekly, and we, of course, record it. So the rewatch of today IVF webinars will be available on our website tomorrow. And by this time, we have a huge source of IVF knowledge uh, available on our website. And you can find it at eggdonationfriends.com slash IVF dash webinars. It's our 68th webinar today, and you can be sure that will be more because we are planning for, for the next year. And as we are here for you, if you have any ideas of subjects, just let us know and feel free to throw me an email and write to me directly at sophie at ivfmedia.org. IVF webinars are brought to you with help of our partners and our partners are National Fertility Society, Fertility Clinics Abroad and Donor Conception Network. And today, this evening, we are here to talk about IVF and male factor and techniques which can be used to make sure that best sperm is used to fertilization. Of course, we have a great expert in this field to present the subject in depth. And we are here with Elisa Filipiak, embryologist, biologist, and biotechnologist at Salva Medica in Poland. Uh, she is a specialist in male infertility diagnosis and co-author of Polish Society of Andrology Guidelines regarding semen evaluation. After the presentation, which will take around 25 minutes, we will continue, of course, with Q&A session. So if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free and type those questions in the chat section, starting even from now. And yes, from me, that's it for now. Uh, Elisa, are we ready? Can we start? I'm ready. <laughs> and let's yes, go. I'm glad to hear that. Fingers crossed. Good luck. And let's do this. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to give this short lecture to you. I hope um, this, uh, this will help you to get more knowledge about the male infertility. So I'm a, a let's say I'm a specialist in the male diagnosis, male infertility diagnostics. I like male, so <laughs> that's it. Uh, just to start, but I'm sure every many of you already knows that uh, we have some female and male problems when we we consider infertility. Uh, there are many sources uh, showing that uh, there is like 20 percent uh, of, of female problems 34 percent 34 five percent of some some problems here whatever source you take everything uh, all these sources are um in a, in a concordance with the information that we have female problems, male problems. Sometimes we have, unfortunately, problems in both partners. And there is a part of the cake, piece of this cake, where the infertility cause is unknown. So it means probably it's either on the female or either on the male side. So also can be both. So I hope everybody here and um, Mm, yeah, general knowledge is uh, which is up to date is that male also contribute to fertility, and more and more information is that it's a um, it's on the male side that where is the problem. I call it problem, yeah, because of course the problem is to be solved, but. Uh, for, for our better communication, the, this word problem can remain here. Um, 
So that, just to <coughs> give you gen some general information about what we do in Salve Medica for the um, diagnostics of male infertility. Um, so of course we perform general semen analysis, manual and computer assisted when where we test if we have sperm, we test their concentration, motility, vitality, and uh, morphology means if they are built correctly. Um, so these are some general para parameters of this analysis. But also we perform some additional tests and assays, for example, sperm antibody test, uh, hyaluronian binding, chromatin structure test, of course, some microbiological tests, uh, measurement of oxidative stress, swim up techniques, uh, also some biochemistry uh, uh, markers in semen, which are the markers of um, prostate, prostate gland, uh, seminal vesicles, or epididymis. Um, uh, if we are looking for where is the problem exactly, um, of course, uh, the, the previous. Uh, tests were done in semen, but of course we can uh, do many more, uh, like genetic uh, testing, of course, hormonal blood testing, and uh, a little bit I will tell uh, about this early embryo development observation. I will tell more about that at the very end of the presentation. So these are just general things we can do, um, or and we do for our patients. And generally, what I wanted to stress here is that um, assisted reproductive technology uh, can can be used for some for different reasons. Uh, first of all, we try to treat the patient, both female and male, if it's possible. If the treatment is not um, yeah had failed we can send this patient to assisted reproductive techniques. Uh, sometimes the treatment is not possible, so not to waste the time for the treatment, uh, we can send these patients and offer them the assisted reproductive technology. And sometimes it's a patient's decision that they don't want to treat anything, they don't want any uh, therapies because, for, for example, they are um, uh, they don't want to waste their time, whatever, and they decide to go for assisted reproductive technology. So in such a situation, and probably you can imagine sometimes many more situations, we can implement um, these techniques to help patients to have a baby. Um, this is also a kind of general information that as long as possible, it is better to mimic nature when we perform artificial fertilization. Uh, it's because the nature had a plan, plan how to how the fertilization should occur for many many years, and in the evolution evolution of uh, our species, it was planned somehow, and the egg and the sperm they know how to connect how to which sperm should be chosen etc so if possible <coughs> sorry it's better if we let the nature uh, act but in some cases of course we have to interfere with the fertilization process significantly. I mean, for example, when ICSI is performed, and then it's less likely for the nature to decide. I will show you why it's like this. So in natural pregnancies, this is the ovum who is responsible for choosing the, the best sperm and we we can say that the ovum has some types, uh, and the ovum is the the um, best one to know which sperm is the correct one to be chosen for fertilization. But when we use artificial methods, especially ICSI, this responsibility is not longer 
on the ovum, it's on the in the embryologist's hand, and more particularly in embryologist's eyes. Um, I wanted to show you why it's like this. Sophia, if you can give me the first movie. Here we have a movie from in vitro, traditional in vitro fertilization. You see the ovum here and these small guys here, you see, there are sperm. They are running here, swimming around, and they are trying to get to the, um, to the ovum. You see, and this, this is, of course, in in vitro se settings, but this is more or less how this process look like in nature. Yes, in the ampulla of Oviductus, such a process occurs that many small dudes are trying to get through this wall of granulosa cells and try to get inside the uh, the ovum and this process is let's say it's more or less natural sometimes we have to transfer this process to the uh, glass and then it's called in vitro fertilization but the process as oh, as long as possible we try to do uh, this kind of fertilization sophie if you could um, start another movie please and now I will show you the ICSI procedure when uh, we use it in, for example, in the cases where there is not enough sperm to let them um, fertilize the egg themselves, uh, sometimes, or if they are immortal. Have you seen that? One sperm was taken um, to the needle, and now we have the ovum. It's a kind of naked ovum without these granulosa cells, which were seen in the previous movie, because now we have to put the needle inside this cell, this ovum. You see the sperm here, and we just put the sperm inside the cell, and that's how the fertilization occurs. So in this procedure, there is no place for a sperm ovum interaction and for the, let's say, ovum decision, which sperm should be chosen. As in this uh, situation, this is the embryologist who chose the sperm. Yes? I hope you see the difference. And this is the difference which I think is a quite important. And now I would like to show you how do we know as embryologists which sperm should be chosen for this fertilization. Of course, we are not always correct in our thinking, but we are employing some techniques to make it uh, more and more um, uh, correct. Uh, the, the first choice is, if we have a choice, we choose the motile sperm, because for sure the motile sperm is the better one than immotile sperm. Probably it should be like this. Immotile one can be dead, so it's useless for um, fertilization. <clears throat> but sometimes we can additionally facilitate this decision which sperm should should be should be taken out of the group of sperm so um, in general we use two techniques for that one of them is some um, selection of non apoptotic sperm and um, what is apoptosis maybe some of you have heard this word generally apoptosis it is plant cell death um, for sure you are aware of this, that some millions of cells uh, every day in our body are sent to death. And of course, uh, new cells are, um, yeah, some cells are dividing. And so in this way, the new cells <clears throat> appear. So, and the organism, our body, decide which cells are to be sent 
for death, let's say, which is plant death apoptosis. And it's the same with sperm. So we have normally in the normal ejaculate when the test uh, testes uh, of the men work correctly, we have millions of sperm every day. It's impossible that all of this sperm is correct. I would say that majority of this sperm is not correct. And for sure, some of them are damaged somehow that the, our body decides, okay, this sperm is not correct. Let's send it for apoptosis. Then <coughs> it's, um, yeah, because it's useless. Um, and in uh, um, artificial in, um, techniques, sometimes we don't know which sperm is on the way to apoptosis because at the beginning of this way, it looks absolutely the same as the healthy, healthy sperm. Uh, but fortunately now we have a technique to distinguish these two groups and not to use for the bad sperm, the apoptotic sperm for ICSI. Because, of course, if we use the, the sperm who is going to die, which is on the way to apoptosis, if we use such a sperm for ICSI, if we inject this sperm to the ovum, it's useless. It will not be successful as it's, in fact, it's dying. So it's very important to distinguish these two groups. <clears throat> and we, uh, uh, from a scientific point of view, we use the technique that the uh, sperms which are going to be uh, dead by apoptosis, they, they have the amino acid phosphatidylserine, let's, let's say, emitted to the outside of the sperm head, and this is the, the main difference. Of course, we cannot see it in a microscope. This only can be uh, seen on the um, chemical, let's say, chemical level. But we can, can, by magnetic separation, get rid of this uh, apoptotic sperm. And then we have a sperm population which is healthy, which is not going to undergo apoptosis. And this can be used to ICSI. So we have one technique. And uh, the other one is called PIXI. This uh, prefix P uh, before ICSI means physiological, physiological ICSI. And what's that about? Mm, the sperm, if it's uh, correct, has a hyaluronian acid re receptor on his head. This is, of, of course, just a scam of this to, to, to show you uh, that this receptor is necessary. <coughs> Hyalur hyaluronic acid is um, present in the uh, granulosa cell, cells, the um, layer of cells I showed you at the first movie. Uh, this is the these are the cells which are surrounding the uh, ovum and the sperm to fertilize the egg in natural uh, situation has to have this receptor because it has to bind to this hyaluronic acid uh, which is uh, in the ovum and of course also if uh, the sperm has this receptor it means it's correct in many other ways. It's mature, uh, it's healthy, uh, and it's just the one who can fertilize the egg, uh, in contrary with the sperm, which has no um, receptor, hyaluronian, hyaluronian acid receptor on his head, and which this sperm is um, unable to uh to be used for fertilization and of course in some male we have like 90 percent of sperm which are correct regarding the um, presence of uh, the, this receptor so this is a good situation in some male we have like 10 percent of motile sperm 
which have this receptor. So, of course, if we choose the sperm for ICSI without the knowledge which sperm has the receptor, we can uh, use 10 sperm to fertilize 10 eggs, but nine of them would be um, unsuccessful because the sperm is not correct. So we have a technique to choose the sperm who or which <laughs> has the receptor. Uh, so just before ICSI, we check which sperm can bind to the hyaluronic acid, and we choose the sperm who bond it, and this one is selected for ICSI. So that's that's about this technique. <clears throat> of course, at the beginning, when I show you the uh, assays we perform, uh, we can test uh, in advance uh, if uh, for, for this patient, this PICSI is um, the, 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 the technique which can help. Because, of course, if the patient has 90% of uh, correct sperms, maybe it's not um, very important to do this technique, but if he has only several percent of correct sperm, then it might be crucial to use such a technique. What, how we can also help <coughs> the patients, for example, who has no sperm in ejaculate? Of course, in some situation when we have azoospermia, um, meaning uh, no sperm in ejaculate, um, this, uh, the causes of this situation can be different. But, but in some situation, it's not the cause that the test tests are not producing the sperm. The problem is that the, um, the vas deferens is obstructed or something like this, that the sperm are produced in the testes, in the testes but they are not appearing in a ejaculate or this is one case and the other case is that they are hmm, they are produced in testes but in very very small amounts uh, the amounts are that small that we cannot see the sperm in ejaculate so in both of these situations we can perform tese which is testicular sperm extraction so we uh, do a kind of a puncture of a testis, a very little surgery to the testis, and we can get the sperm directly from the testis um, and use them for ICSI. Because just for, for your knowledge, the sperm which are, which are taken directly from the testis, they are not motile, they cannot um, fertilize the egg themselves because they cannot swim there. So in, in this situation, we usually um, use the sperm which are immotile and we have to do ICSI. The sperm uh, which are, um, uh, I say, um, the sperm uh, which are um, released from the testes are not motile. They are getting the ability to, the ability for emotion when they mature, when they are maturing in the epidemies. That's, that's, the, that's why the sperm from, from tesse or micro tesse are not motile and has to be used um, for X. Uh, and just <laughs> a couple of words about the early embryo development. In some cases, we can know. Uh, yes, please, uh, Sofia, you can you can start the movie. Here you can see the nine embryos uh, from the very first hours of their um, development uh, through the um, through five days of their development. Uh, and we can observe them every, let's say, 20 minutes uh, without taking them out from the incubator. It's just how, how, how you see it now. There are some micro cameras um, watching every step of the development. And at the end of the day five, when we make a decision which embryo to choose, Basing on the 
observation how they developed, we can choose which embryo is the, be the best one. Even if, let's say, three of these embryos developed into the blastocyst, uh, by observing um, these movies, we can decide which out of these three is the best one. Uh, so that's uh, how um, this kind of uh, observation help us also to choose the the best embryo. And of course, the embryo um, development is also influenced by the quality of the sperm used. Sometimes the sperm can be alive, um, can be motile, can be chosen uh, out of many others by uh, one of our techniques. But sometimes uh, it's also not the best one. Uh, and sometimes we can see it from the very early uh, embryo development observation. Um, basing on this information, I would just um, leave you with the such an information that sometimes the in vitro procedure is not only a therapeutic one. Sometimes it's a diagnostic procedure that we, after the in vitro, we know something more about the problem of this couple, of male, female, whoever. Um, and sometimes it's unfortunately a long way from the first in vitro to the successful one because uh, sometimes we get some additional knowledge basing on some steps uh, which I already show you or, or which are also um, a little bit hidden now. Uh, and uh, for many patients uh, from uh, who had the in vitro cycle in our clinics, we have learned that sometimes we can know the reason of infertility after in vitro procedure, but we cannot know it before. So that's some a kind of general uh, message. And that was my last slide. So thank you very much. And I guess Sophie will start with questions now. So feel free to ask uh, for, for anything uh, you want. I hope I will be uh, able to answer. <laughs> Yes, and thank you for a great presentation. Uh, indeed, we will have now Q&A session. Mm, some people are typing, so we will wait a second uh, for questions, uh, hopefully coming up. Yes, and we have questions already. So just let me publish the first one. Are there genetic or aging issues that hurt male fertility? Does family history matters? Mm, of course, <laughs> yes, <laughs> especially when answering the first part of this question. Uh, there are many genetic reasons for uh, male infertility, for bad uh, quality of the sperm, of the semen, and I'm even not, uh, um, it's even not possible to list them all now. Uh, and um, when when I uh, look at the newest um, scientific lit literature uh, in this topic, it's like every month there uh, there are scientists, there are different scientific groups um, discover a other gene which is responsible for some type of, of infertility or sperm damage, etc. So for sure, genetic um, genetic is responsible, uh, but but not only genetic. Sometimes also environmental factors are um, damaging our sperm and uh, influence to to problems with fertility. But of course, aging also hurts. Uh, Mm, general knowledge uh, is like the female becomes uh, infertile when he, when she enters menopause uh, period, but and and the male can have babies till the end of his life. But of and of course it's true somehow. But uh, the research which are published now show that 
the fertility of the male also decreases uh, uh, with time, with the age of the man. And also they show that the sperm uh, accumulate the um, genetic mutation much faster than the ovum. Although we all know that after, uh, when the um, female is um, older than 35, it's uh, um, uh, it has uh, yeah the risk to have, for example, baby with Down syndrome is high. But this is also for the male. So yeah, so of course, men can have a baby when he's 70, but his chance and the risk for the baby. The chance is smaller, the risk is bigger, right? So, so that's the um, that's the case. And uh, answering to the uh, second question, does the family history matter? Sometimes, yes. It, this is about the genetic. Um, so that we are, uh, our genes are somehow from our parents. <laughs> somehow they are from our parents. So. Sometimes if the father had problem with uh, fertility, it might be that his son has the problem. It's not always like this, but for sure this has to has to be like this. And thank you for your answer to this question. Mm, we will now take a look at the next question. And this will be this one. Is DNA sperm fragmentation really giving reliable answers if semen is okay? <clears throat> from, from my point of view, yes. But it's like, um, you have to remember that uh, we never treat the result. If the patient has a bad DNA fragmentation and he conceives the baby, okay wonderful and everybody is happy but if the there is a problem with fertility male female we, we don't know sometimes and we have the um, dna fragmentation test showing that there is like 50 percent of um not fragmented sp sperm dna only we can <coughs> assume that this might be the um the problem but uh, believe me i have seen patients with the results i i not not only mean the sperm fragmentation but also some other results uh, that from the result we would say that the, the patient has a very big problem with fertility and after some weeks or months uh, this patient has the spontaneous pregnancy. So it's always that we don't treat the result only. We want to treat the problem, which is not having a baby. Uh, yeah, and, and you... Um, so the results are somehow um, um, helping us to to find the reason, but they are not the, the reason. I hope you, you understand what I mean. Yes, and thank you for the explanation. To and and maybe if I can uh, just uh, make more, one more comment about the sperm fragmentation. Sperm fragmentation is, not, is also not something which is given uh, to these patients forever because for the fragmentation uh, for sperm fragmentation is caused by many factors also by the uh, inflammation which can be treated also by some environmental factors which can be sometimes which can be let's say cancelled uh, by the uh, high temperature uh, by the lifestyle. So sometimes DNA fragmentation is, um, is something we cannot influence, but sometimes we can influence that and we can um, uh, cause that less sperm has a fragmented DNA. So uh, keep in mind that uh, this is something sometimes we can help. 
before we start IVF or anything like this. And thank you for additional comments to the previous answer to the question which we have now. <laughs> uh, we will now take a look at the, ne at the next question. <clears throat> yes, and here it is. Oh, How we have had a donor cycle with donor eggs and my husband's sperm. We were told the donor was very fertile. The result was 50% fertilization with ICSI, four embryos in total. We think this is very poor for donor X. What could the reason be? Embryo quality on day 5, 1, uh, 3 AA, 1, 2 AA, and on day 6, 1, 1 AA, and 1, 2 AB. We have had one failed transfer with the 3 AA. Wondering if it's worth trying the lower quality embryos and why is the fertilization so low? <laughs> oh, of course, uh, to answer to this question with 100%, um, to be sure for 100%, I'm not able to answer and I think nobody's uh, able to answer that. But uh, I don't know how many uh, eggs were uh, fertilized here that we had only four embryos in total, but uh, it can be that th the reason can be in the sperm. Sometimes it's like this, that uh, not all the sperm chosen for ICSI were correct, even if the, some, some techniques, uh, as I showed you, were used. Um, so this is something we cannot help. Uh, if uh, um, answering to the question, if it's uh, worth trying, yeah, I think if you have embryos, it's it's always worth trying because it's not like this that only the best quality embryos uh, bring about um, pregnancy. We have such a situation that usually we use the best um, embryos, the, the best quality embryos at the beginning for the first uh, cycle, for the first transfer. And we don't have the pregnancy. And then we try, for example, with the second very good quality embryo and we do not have the pregnancy and then we try with the la with the last very poor embryo which seems very poor for us and we have pregnancy so you never know of course there is a matter of chance and risk always in, in um, fertility treatments it's more about the chances it's never about uh, being sure you have success or not so unfortunately it works like this and um, but i know for the patient is one or zero yeah you are pregnant you are not pregnant uh, but we are more based on the chances let's say we can say you have statistically 50 percent of chance to have a baby from this embryo and from this you have 30 percent but these are only per, per, per percentage points. These are not what you are interested in, baby or not the baby. I hope it helps. And uh, unfortunately, what I can advise here is keep trying because if you don't try uh, and if it's uh, the, um, the procedure which can help, if you don't try, you don't have a baby. Sorry, unfortunately, it works like this. And thank you for you answering this question and your explanation as well. Um, of course, we have next question. And this will be this one. Is the tandem cycle in terms of semen possible? We are thinking of fertilizing some of my eggs with partner semen and rest with donors. Uh, in our clinic is possible. I don't know if in in other in if a, a, each clinic is performing such a cycle, but yes, and sometimes it's uh, done. Um, mm, yes, it, sometimes it's done, um, especially if, uh, for example, uh, we as embryologists think that maybe this semen is not perfect. We see, it, let's say, from previous cycles that we have very good eggs and we um, <coughs> per try to fertilize them with the partner semen, and we would expect 
we have 80% of fertilization rate and the blast and the develop development of the embryos and we have only 10% or nothing so for the next cycle or or the third cycle we will recommend to use the donor sperm but we can check both donor and partner semen and we can have a look which embryos develops better so this is then it's also what i told you the kind of a diagnostic procedure that we know if this semen is um, useful or not and uh, basing on this question i have a short story which may sh show you what what sometimes can happen we had a couple in some years ago we had a couple uh, she had a lot of uh, eggs she was uh, also the donor for other females of the eggs and uh, her um, receivers were all pregnant she was not getting pregnant with the semen of her husband we uh, um, did the first cycle which i told you about then we they tried another cycle they wanted to fertilize all all eggs with the se semen of the husband uh, i don't remember maybe we had transfer but the, the pregnancy did not occur for the first cycle we decided with the couple to do this tandem cycle to uh, try donor sperm and husband sperm um, for some um, um, ovums we tried husband sperm for the others we we tested the donor sperm and at the end of the day we had to transfer the embryo from the donor sperm because they developed and the, the embryos from <coughs> husband sperm did not develop and she got pregnant with this donor um, donor embryo and the, the child was born and after i don't know after maybe half of a year uh after this the first child was born she called us that she is pregnant with her husband naturally uh although they tried for many years before the first cycle although we saw this salmon and sh the salmon was let's say hopeless although the, all these cycles with this husband sperm was not successful after mm, the first pregnancy they uh, yeah and after the pregnancy and the live birth they had the second spontaneous pregnancy so they have one the first baby from the donor sperm and the second baby both healthy born and healthy from the husband sperm so you never know what happened. And thank you for the answer and for the story as well. And of course, we have the next question coming up. Do you think <coughs> it's best to start with ICSI right away? We're having mobility problem or give it try natural way? Uh, mm. For sure, it's always better to try the natural way, but I'm not sure if you mean here the natural way without the, any help from the artificial techniques. Anyway, natural, natural way is the, always the best choice. But if it's not successful, uh, the, the, in our clinic, we first what we choose first is the uh, ah with IVF is IVF but sometimes if we see the motility is very pure we would recommend ICSI because IVF only can be done if we have enough sperm if and if they are mobile sometimes it's case by case discussion with the couple because um, it's sometimes that uh, at the day when the result when the test analysis is performed the semen is uh, better or worse at the day of the fertilization uh, out of the blue we have better sperm so we can we semen sperm we have more bigger concentration better motility <coughs> so then we can try ivf but um 
if possible, in my opinion, IVF should be uh, used. But if not possible, uh, it's better to use ICSI, but it has to be decided case by case. And thank you for your explanation uh, to this question, uh, of course, as well. And for the question, thank you one more time. And we will now take a closer look at the next question. Do you have experience with vasectomy reversal and uh, using TESE or MESA material? Is it better to find motile sperm instead? Mm, it's of course better to find motile sperm because they are not only this is not only the matter of being motile or not this is the matter of being more mature for the sperm uh, after vasectomy hmm, uh, i would say um, generally the urologist who perform vasectomy claims it can be reversed and there is no problem we think of sometimes it can be reversed sometimes it can be reversed so successfully that the um, man can have baby without any help but usually vasectomy damages the testes somehow it's not the direct damage to the testes because of course the testes are not damaged during vasectomy but um this is in uh, the testes and the uh, epithelium where the sperm is produced is damaged indirectly after the vasectomy when the fluid produced in the sperm is going back to the uh, um, seminiferous tubules and make a pressure to the uh, seminiferous tubule so um that's the way how the vasectomy can uh, interfere with the sperm production uh, and everything depends on the um, particular man uh, and of course of the time from the vasectomy to the reversing vasectomy uh, so if uh, generally if vasectomized patients wants to have a baby uh, this of course has to be the patient decision how to perform but if the reversing is possible i would try that and if it's not successful then we can try to get the sperm from epididymis or from from the epididymis first then from the testes uh and that's the order it should be planned for me of course and thank you for your answer to this question and your explanation uh, we will have the next question and this question is is it true that if a man is over 50 uh, risk of schizophrenia at the baby increased and any other diseases uh, particularly about schizophrenia i i don't know maybe some probably sometimes perform such a study uh, and uh, if they proved that maybe that something is something like this is possible but generally if you ask about any other disease generally i would say yes this is connected with what i told you at the very beginning of this um, uh, uh, question and answer se se uh, session that the risk for the the risk of infertility and somehow the risk for the child is increasing with the female and male partner age it's not like uh, uh, every child uh, born from the father who is 60 years old would be healthy it's still uh, the percentage is very low but it's uh, basing on the scientific um, public, um, papers it's higher uh, in um, when the woman and the man is older 
So this is general. Thank you for the question and the answer, of course. Uh, we have a few questions to go. So we will take the next one. How <coughs> is the male nutrition? What kind of food helps sperm quality? What do you think of supplements? Would you recommend vitamins and folic acid for the men or something else? Uh, for sure, the nutrition is important, not only for fertility, but for the general health. Now, the um, topic of uh, oxidative stress is very modern, uh, as the um, etiology of many uh, illnesses and probably also infertility. So, uh, um, generally, we have to fight with the oxidative stress uh, to have better uh, semen quality. This means we need to eat, male men need to eat the uh, antioxidants. This is very general what I say now. Uh, means vi vitamins, um, uh, they, they should eat uh, what they don't uh, like. <laughs> so uh, vegetables, some fruit, <laughs> uh, they should not smoke because it also influences the oxidative stress very much. Uh, and what about the supplements? Of course, there are many supplements for male infertility. And um, if, if the question is if they help, I would say they help if the reason of infertility or if, if the reason of fertility problem is the lack of something what is in the in the supplement content so then they can help somehow but if the problem is different if it's somewhere else eating vitamins supplements uh, vegetables would not help because the, the problem is not the, the oxidative stress. So, yeah, that, that would be my answer to this question. And thank you very much for the answer. And it's impossible that people do not like vegetables and fruit. How is it possible? I, I, I said men, <laughs> not people. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we will now take the next question. Mm. Yes, the important one as well. When it comes to sperm count, what is a normal range? Concentrate. There are two refer referral values here. Uh, it's a concentration, which is according to WHO in 2010, 15 million per milliliter. And there is also the second uh, reference value, which is the number of sperm per ejaculate, which is now, according to the same guidelines, 39 million per the ejaculate. And uh, as per WHO, it's okay if one of these is, um, is within the uh, refer referral, uh, reference range. So if you have, uh, Small, smaller concentration, let's say 10 million per milliliter, but you have 5 milliliters of semen, it means you have 15 mil millions per ejaculate, you are, it's okay. But just, yeah, this is a good point, normal range. What's normal range? In fertility, uh, this is not a norm. This is a this is called um, reference value, and uh, it doesn't mean that if you are below the reference value in one parameter or or even in all parameters you are infertile. I mean the male is infertile because this is um, yeah it's a long story how these uh, values were set set up, but generally it doesn't mean that if you are below, you are um, not fertile. It may mean that your chances are lower, but uh, as long, we say, as long as you have one sperm, one motile sperm, 
the men can be fertile, especially that the semen quality um, is not the same during the uh, time. Uh, it's influenced by many, many factors. So you can be below result, below the reference values one day, and in two months you can be under, uh, you can be above reference values. So it's not a stable parameter. Um, so that's about the normal range. And thank you for your explanation uh, to this question. And uh, this will be also the final call for the questions. So if anybody waits until now to ask the question, please type those uh, in the chat section as we will be slowly finishing. But for now, I believe that we have one more question to go. Mm. And this question is this one. Does acupuncture help to improve the quality of a sperm? What is your opinion? Uh, I don't have this experience from um, our patients, but I believe it may help. As, as we also said about many other uh, illnesses, diseases, where egg acupuncture has proven um, influence, I believe also for fertility, both on male and female uh, side, it can help, but I have no experience and uh, as well, I don't know any scientific lit literature about this. Yes, of course, and thank you for uh, the answer to this question. And as we do not have any questions, we still have some shout outs, which I, of course, will present to you. Thank you. <laughs> and one more time, huge thank you for the presentation and for all the answers to all the questions which uh, yeah, which we have uh, asked you today. And somebody is typing. Uh, we will just take a second and wait. Uh, but yes, it will be again a shout out. Yes. In the meantime, I just want to also say uh, good good night or good day wherever you are. <laughs> uh, and thank you for for listening to me. I hope it was um, informative. Uh, and uh, gave you some new knowledge about that. But the problem is very wide and very complicated. So I'm sorry I was not able to give you the precise answers that do that, do that, because it, it's impossible if someone tells you that. It means it, he or she does not know anything about fertility problems. Yes, and thank you, uh, especially for your knowledge and for the honesty uh, of all the information uh, you were giving us. So uh, really huge thank you. It was, it was a pleasure to have you here today. We will be finishing uh, today webinar. And of course, please subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel or uh, follow us on social media. So we will be always up to date. And of course, you will find there also uh, the recording from today, especially on YouTube, where we upload every uh, rewatch from uh, IVF webinars. Of course, we will be here next week and the next week and the next week. So if you have time and if you feel like joining us, we will be honored and of course uh, we started something new IVF webinars uh, in German so if you have any German friends or you prefer my, maybe uh, German uh, language you can also join IVF webinars in German different topic different specialists so <coughs> you can sign up for this webinar as well and one more time thank you Elisa and thank you Salva Medica Bye. See you the next time. <laughs> See you. Thank you. One more time. Bye.